Interested? Thank you all very much for coming uh, on this beautiful day. A very special thank you and a very warm welcome Sorry. to our guest, uh, Professor Tarak Barkawi, who is coming to us from the New School for Social uh, Research from all the way from exciting New York. Now, uh, Tarak has a PhD from the University of Minnesota, and he actually moved to the New School very recently after 10 years in Cambridge. Uh, we persuaded him to come back. He was just too far for our taste. And as many of you know, he specializes in the study of war, armed forces, and society, and has a special focus on the conflict between the West and the non-European world, both in a historical perspective and in a contemporary setting. Uh, he has, you know very well, he has contributed extensively to critical IR theory and to strategic studies. He has written on colonial armies, small wars, imperialism, as well as counterinsurgency and the war on terror. Uh, among his many publications, uh, let me just remind you of a very recent book, uh, which is Orientalism and War, co-edited with Keith Stansky and published this year by Columbia University Press, so it's very hot. I encourage all of January. you to read it in January. That's it. Um, as hot buy as it, it gets, buy it, buy it, buy it now. <laughs> uh, I'm sure, again, you, many of you have read his work, but perhaps you do not know so much about his talent for the practical side of international relations. He has worked extensively with the uh, UK and US armed forces in educational and advisory capacities. And somehow he has also found time to contribute to Al Jazeera online in English. A very impressive CV. We are delighted that you made time to come and talk to us. And please join me in welcoming our guest, Professor Tarak Barkawi. Thank you very much. About 50, 50 minutes. Yeah. yeah, we have an hour and a half as a session. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let me give you a little thematic introduction and then I'll dive into my material. So, small wars, big consequences. Violent conflict is a generative force in world politics. War draws combatant societies into its vortex and reshapes them. Its effects, war's effects, are readily evident. In the case of major conflagrations between great powers, wars which signpost entire eras and define the character of international relations from Napoleon to Hitler. Less obvious are the ways in which small wars, too, have shaped people, peoples and places, as well as the very nature of world politics. When great powers send their armed forces to defeat faraway peoples, the histories of metropolitan and peripheral, uh, peripheral societies become entwined in explosive and unpredictable ways. Relations between the global north and south have generally been read under the sign of, a, of economy, of combined and uneven development, or culture, of course. Yet modernity arguably began with the small wars of the Spanish conquest of the Americas and has been marked ever since by continual conflict as great powers sought to control the fate of peoples and territories in the non-European world. The brutality required to repress and save the souls of Indians in the Americas split the Franciscans and the Dominicans in Spain. Ever since, small war has been the site of co-constitutive transnational histories that have shaped societies in the North and the South. Around such wars, global identities have taken shape, white man, native, civilized, savage, Occident, Orient, counterinsurgent, insurgent, are all terms fundamentally marked by histories and styles of imperial warfare. Glimpsed here are the ways in which small war has shaped society, culture, and politics on a world scale, and how it informed the very categories by which we carve up the globe and its peoples. Now that's my big canvas, uh, and the starting point for what I hope will be two books, one of which will be, and I hope they won't take as long as the last one, one of which will be a, a synoptic project called Small Wars in World Politics, and the other one will be Orientalism and the Korean War. Uh, so I'm sort of working this as a general IR project and as another research monograph on, on exploring these themes with, with particular respect to the Korean War. And the theme is, it's very simple. Why do small wars have big consequences in the West? As a matter of historical observation, small wars gone wrong increasingly come to play prominent roles in metropolitan politics and society in the 19th and 20th centuries. 
political and cultural contestation over limited wars generated by imperial commitments came to a head when, comes to a head when things do not go as expected. The political fortunes of Benjamin Disraeli, William Gladstone, Jules Ferry, Francisco Crispy, William McKinley, among others, revolved in some measure around small wars. With the turn of the 20th century, especially its last half, the severity and consequences of defeat began to mount. Anti-colonial nationalist wars in the Third World led to regime change in France and Portugal, while the Vietnam War remains the most significant moment in American politics and society since 1945. War against non-European others generates social, political, and cultural reaction and change in Western societies. The term small wars turns out to be ironic, a disdainful attempt to name and contain energies that would come to overwhelm Western governments and transform politics a half century after its coinage in 1906. My thesis is straightforward. The generative character, the cultural and social productivity of such wars is a consequence of the constitutive role of the Orient, broadly understood in Western identities. Western identities are committed in diverse ways to notions of Western vitality, strength, and dominance over non-European peoples. At the same time, these identities evince a fear of and a fascination with the other, the Orient. Evidence of Oriental power and potency, for example, the rise of Japan or China, has a capacity to disrupt Western narratives, leading not only to moments of self-doubt and critique, but also fueling energies for change or redoubled efforts at continued dominance in new circumstances. And there is no more obvious sign of Western weakness and Oriental strength than defeat in battle or failure to obtain victory. Unsurprisingly then, such set setbacks become sites of cultural disruption and production at all levels in Western society. So now I'm gonna go on to say something about war and Orientalism, about the relational character of identities at war uh, as the mechanism for big consequences of small wars, and I'll close by drawing some of these themes together uh, in the case of Korea if I, if I have time. So first, war and Orientalism, a subject I'm sure all of you are well educated on, but nonetheless, let me lay out my, set out my stall. Uh, Orientalism posits two separate but mutually constitutive worlds, the West and the Orient. They're usually imagined as radically different and separate, but are defined in terms of one another through a shifting set of binary distinctions, West-East, rational-irrational or passionate, civilized barbarian, adult child, democracy des despotism, individual mass, white, brown, or black, to take a few central uh, identity binaries. As Said argues, Orientalism both produces the Orient, it creates a vision of it, and elaborates an account of the West. Orientalist constructions inform the identities, ideologies, and imaginaries of Western societies, and they do so in part through shifting notions of the West and its purposes in world history. The concept of Orientalism arises from and largely intends to be employed in studies of scholarly and literary texts. There's also work on popular culture and of course some work uh, in IR and elsewhere on the administrative, political, economic, and military discourses involved in imperial expansion and rule and in Western foreign and military policies towards the non-European world. Yet Orientalism <coughs> remains, as an academic topic, remains too much a matter of cultural style a form of intellectual authority over the Orient. These are Said's words. It's all about how the West represents others in ways which build up a positive notion of the Western self while demeaning non-European peoples. Orientalism is always about Western superiority. As Said remarks, it puts the Westerner in a whole series of possible relationships with the Orient without ever losing him the relative upper hand. The Orient offers, quote, very little resistance to this imagined world. Now, in one sense, this is absolutely correct. If we're interested in how US Americans uh, construct the outside world, how that world really is, what it's really like, is beside the point. What's important is how Americans understand it, imagine it within terms of their own myths, narratives, and identities, and then act upon it. This standpoint leads to what I want to call an internalist character to analyses of representations of war and violence in disciplines such as American and cultural studies. They turn to American national history to account for the development of cultural frames, 
from Puritan Indian hating and horror at Indian sensuality, to cowboys and Indians in the Wild West, to my lie, to parody the connections uh, some of these traditions of inquiry make. Uh, David A. Campbell, of course, employs similar moves in his classic IR text, Writing Security, where he focuses on how the Puritan idea of the city on the hill informed US security discourses in the Cold War. It's as if cultural histories respected national sovereignty and were disconnected from the wider world. The agency of those constructed as oriental or other remains hidden. This internal approach, internalist approach on its own is flawed because we live in an interconnected world made up of opposing wills of other peoples who do not accept genocide or colonial domination passively and who in war and armed re resistance fight back as living, breathing, thinking, thinking opponents seeking to impose their will, their story on us. They are in another internalist world, in another movie. While George Bush was watching Sands of Iwo Jima, Iraqi insurgents were celebrating Saladin's victory over the Crusaders at the Horns of Hattin. What I'm sketching here is war as a space for the clash of wills and worldviews, replete with the unexpected for both sides. As a social activity, as a set of relations, war is above all marked by chaos and unpredictability, with outcomes rarely determined in advance. Perhaps in no other realm of human endeavor does Fortuna reign as supreme as she does in war. Small happenings, as Napoleon reminds us, can have major consequences. War is a resistant medium for human purposes. It defeats them, reshapes them. Said was, in my view, profoundly mistaken to argue that the Orient offered very little resistance to the imagined worlds of Orientalism. As you'll see in a minute, the, the Orient has been resisting from the very beginning. This resistance, this armed agency, shaped the character and nature of Orientalist discourse in significant ways. But it does so not by forcing us to abandon Orientalist readings of the other altogether, but by forcing shifts in Orientalism to find new ways of being Orientalist in new times. These new, new ways are often deeply consequential for politics and society, as well as foreign policy in the West. As an example, Think of the shifts in American politics from the liberal, US American politics, from the liberal Cold War uh, interventionism that helped get the US into Vietnam to the hard-headed, unapologetic unapolog Western triumphalism of the neoconservatives who helped get the US into Iraq, and did so partly through reframing the meaning of Vietnam in American politics and society. <clears throat> Both positions are Orientalist in character, but in different ways with different consequences. What made the difference was enemy action, as it were, the victory of the Vietnamese communists, not only the influence of time-worn Puritan themes. There is high tension between such an unstable realm as war and the rigid identity constructions Orientalist discourses seek to impose, a tension evinced in the fraught and extremist character of Orientalist representations of war. Events at the front can resist Orientalist frames and conspire to set limits on and expose contradictions in them. Here is where the space is created for debates, contestations, and crises back home. This space is crucially shaped by the forms of mediation available to, between war front and home front, whether print or television media or the reigning degree of faith in, in government statements. The myriad shocks and surprises of war are stark reminders of the contingencies involved in violent conflict. Yet we invest in this contingent realm our most precious, most central identity constructions as the world's leading, as the world's leading people. It is in this unstable mix that all the trouble starts and small wars come to have major consequences. I suggested above that the Orient has been resisting for a long time and that basic features of Orientalism were developed in wartime contexts. More than this, the very idea of the West, along with its history, is born in Orientalist total war. And I'm, of course, referring here to Herodotus, who elaborated a vision of the Greeks through, through a contrast with the Persian Empire they fought. And of course, Herodotus is much more subtle than many of those who use his cultural materials, but that, that's another point. Uh, back then, of course, the Greeks were the weaker party, fighting for their existence on an imperial periphery. A long line of scholars and political and military commentators have made use of the cultural materials already well developed in Herodotus. The Persians as a multitudinous mass who threatened to overwhelm the Greeks, their lack of individuality and freedom, their hierarchical social and political arrangements, their indolence and sensuality, 
the capacity for, indeed, enjoyment of unreasoning, passionate violence, and so on. Orientalism subsequently has been marked by this extremism, by this fear, even as the poles of power shifted to favor the putative West of the day. Already foreshadowed in the ancient Greek narratives is the basic principle of Orientalist war, the civilizing mission. The West frames its use of force in the non-European world almost always in civilizing terms. The modernization of backward peoples often requires violence, ultimately for their own good. Roll back in the Cold War was about liberating the slave world from totalitarian grip. Narratives of peacekeeping and humanitarian intervention partake also of this world of Orientalist war, so I don't think you escape just by being Canadian. Let me develop now an important aspect of Orientalist constructions, and it's, of course, concerning numbers. The opposition between, and this is this aspect I want to talk about, is the opposition between the small band of white men and the overwhelming Asian horde. In the Greek and Persian wars of the 5th and 6th centuries BC, Persian forces outnumbered the Greeks in the major engagements, but the Greeks still managed to defeat a Persian invasion of Greece. The ancient sources, and later their students among European writers and poets, exaggerated the ratios of opposing forces by orders of magnitude, according to modern scholarship, emphasizing the dramatic character of the Greek victory. Subsequently, Whatever the actual strategic context, whoever's powerful, whatever the actual relations of political and military power, this trope of a few outnumbered whites facing off against an oriental horde that far outnumbers them generally has informed representations of war between the West and orientalized others. This is the central trope. I've got one. Um, that's from Zack Snyder's 2007 film uh, uh, 300. Um, if you've seen the film, you'll see there are plenty of examples of the small band of white men uh, facing off against the multitudinous mass of uh, Persians. But I, I chose this picture uh, to show you because you can see the Persian, this is the Persian emperor, is literally made into a monster. Very strong and tall, bigger than the Greek, the Greek but also you know, a little threateningly sensual. Right? Um, it's quite a nice little Orientalist uh, representation there. Um, both the enemy but also desiring the Greek. Now this idea of a small band of white men is central to war movies in general and you'll have a hard time finding a Hollywood war film that doesn't involve a, a, an out, few outnumbered Americans. Uh, uh, despite, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Narratives that invoke the armed oriental multitude have two interrelated characteristics. The first of these is that it always seems to be that the West is on the defensive. Not only are contexts of imperial conquest and domination thereby easily obscured, it also becomes possible to emphasize a defensive victory in the face of a larger catastrophe if, if the East happens to win. The paradigmatic case here, it's the best one I could find, is the oft memorialized fight at Rourke's Drift, where a surrounded company of the 24th foot held off a Zulu impi, uh, forever memorialized in a Michael Caine film called Zulu. Um, and in many, many other histories too numerous to catalog uh, here. Now, of course, what's interesting about Rourke's Drift uh, is that it's a battle that occurs just after the British had tried to invade, on a very flimsy pretext, Zululand and take it over. The British got defeated at Isandalwana, uh, and this is a, a small battle after the main battle at Isandalwana. Despite the fact, then, that this was Western aggression, Rourke's Drift forever stands for the multitudinous mob of Zulus intent on horrifically slaughtering a few whites and, of course, slicing open their, their bellies as Zulu warriors did to allow the soul of the warrior to go to heaven but looks like uh, you know, mutilating bodies if you happen to be uh, on the other side. So Rourke's Drift is popular narrative erasing a, con a context of Western invasion is not so very far from the imagined saga of Jessica Lynch at the outset of the US invasion of Iraq. I hope not everyone here is too young to remember Jessica Lynch. The support company, but of course in Jessica Lynch we add some peculiarly American themes uh, that come from the frontier, our own national orientalism. The support company Lynch served in took a wrong turn and was ambushed a wagon train in Indian country surrounded and taken out, the survivors subject to barbaric treatment by the natives in the mythic retelling. 
This allegedly included the anal rape of Lynch herself, a reprise of the old fearsome spectacles of Indians having their way with white women. The Lynch saga, a media and Pentagon creation, had wellsprings on the American frontier. She was even rescued by a special operations team standing in for the US cavalry, rescued in quotes. For good measure, the Hopi woman in Lynch's unit a Native American was, uh, who was mortally wounded while trying to drive her way out of the ambush was mostly forgotten in the popular retelling. Lynch, of course, never fired her weapon, as befits the white damsel in distress. The Lynch media spectacle reverses the signs of attack and defense. While its armies invaded, the US public fixated on an episode involving an Iraqi ambush. The same move, a defensive battle obfuscating an offensive war, marks also the single most memorialized engagement of the Korean War, the Chosin Reservoir. Here, too, it was the US and UN forces which had invaded North Korea. But the plot placed the US 1st Marine Division on the defensive, fighting their way out of Indian country. Surrounded in the area of Chosin Reservoir by large communist Chinese forces, the Marines and soldiers had to fight their way to the sea. Just as in the mythic American West, the Indians at Chosin often fired down on the Americans from the hills so on and so forth. I say a little bit more about the battle. As if on cue, the official Marine Corps history of the campaign uh, in, invokes Xenophon's Anabasis uh, in telling the story. Xenophon and his Greek mercenaries serving the Persians were betrayed and had to fight their way to the coast through Asiatic hordes. Uh, and this is the classical reference that the US Marine Corps historians turn to. So the first aspect of the Oriental multitude is the small party of outnumbered Westerners, perpetually on the defensive. As I suggest, this trope does a great deal of ideological work in obscuring Western aggression and creating defensive frames in and through which Western publics and elites imagine their place in the world. The notion of containment in the Cold War, a defensive perimeter that encompassed much of the world, is one example. But there is a flip side, and this is the second aspect I wish to draw out. The problem with imaginings of the overwhelming numbers of the Oriental multitude is ultimately they cannot be overcome. There always seem to be more from where the last lot came from. This is what's imperiling about the yellow peril. As one of MacArthur's generals put it some years later, quote, the yellow peril has progressively materialized. Under communist management today, over 800 millions of what they call cheap cannon fodder could conceivably strangulate the West. MacArthur himself complained bitterly about those who resented the commitment of US resources to Asia. MacArthur feel, feared the retreat to an Anglo-Saxon island fortress, and it would mean the destruction of Western civilization in the end overwhelmed by more numerous Asians, by the enormous forces of Asia, as he put it. There were not enough white soldiers to overcome the Asian mass in its, home, in its own homeland. You're trapped in the dynamics of your own representation. In Korea, this is MacArthur's general again, his longtime intelligence chief, uh, Illiterate Chinese coolies could press the trigger of Czech automatic rifles and knock off American draftees in high school or collegiate categories, an economic wastage of appalling significance. The white man is an expensive and limited commodity." End quote. Needless to say, there were many African-American troops in Korea. This is the, oh, that's the filmic envisioning of the chosen reservoir. I'm going to skip that. This is the Marine Corps uh, Gazette from April 1952. It's another classic piece of Orientalist um, representation of war. You'll see the outnumbered white men here. They're on the bottom. I know you can't see them very well. They've been overrun by the Asiatic Horde. You'll notice also, you can see the picture better, a whole bunch of spent cartridges uh, laying around them. And another feature of this picture, which is worth uh, calling up, is that if you didn't see the date up there, you might think that was the Imperial Japanese Army. So there's a mobility between categories of World War II and Korea and later Vietnam. And to push it a little further than I'm going to do today, if I put up a picture, various kinds of cultural representations of Indian attacks, a mass of whooping Indians who are charging you know, willy-nilly in the face of fire, and regardless of casualties, they would look pretty similar too. And you can see the way in which these, this imagery uh, gets carried to new contexts across, across the Pacific. Now, before moving on, you can see that initially the small band of white men, that image is very pleasing to Western eyes and ears. We are defending bravely against the barbarians. But it comes at a price. 
in our imaginations, we are always being threatened by potentially overwhelming numbers. The hordes are coming to get us. So I want to move on now to the relational character of wartime identity constructions. Orientalism involves relational identities. Self and other are inescapably linked. When the other moves, the self shakes. The identity of the Westerner is intimately bound up with constructions of orientalized others. In order for Americans to liberate Iraq, and hence conceive of themselves as liberators, Iraqis must desire liberation. This is not simply misperception, but a form of identity politics on the part of the Americans. To conceive the Iraqis differently, say as a people who regard the US as a violent and unpredictable imperial overlord allied with Zionist interests, requires abandoning the notion that Americans are liberators. Such a reversal marked the crises generated in American society by the Vietnam War. Many Americans did indeed come to see the US as a murderous imperial aggressor in Vietnam in different ways, in part in and through media representations of the war. Events at the front entangled narratives of self and other abroad and at home for elites, soldiers, and publics. In this way, the operational dynamics of a war come to shape and inform in mediated ways representations of that war and their social and political consequences back home can't study the representation of war without studying the events of a war. Here is the armed agency I spoke of earlier, the enemy's opposing will working its effects, disrupting the veils of representation. This is because what is so in Orientalist imagination is not always so on the battlefield. In 1890, 1896, the Italians <coughs> mustered one of the most powerful colonial expeditionary forces ever seen in Africa in order to conquer Ethiopia. It's composed of 16,000 Italian and colonial troops, et cetera, et cetera. And on one March, 1896, the entire force was surrounded and defeated in detail by the Ethiopians at Adawa. It's the largest single defeat of uh, imperial in uh, European colonial history at Adawa in 1896. Now, the consequences of this defeat for Italy extended well beyond the frustration of colonial schemes of conquest. For one, Prime Minister Francesco Crispi's government fell. Moreover, Italian identity, as with Western identity generally, generally was based on the superiority of Europeans over natives. How could this identity be reconciled with a defeat at the hands of the inferior, especially a defeat on this scale? Put simply, we lost to black men. What kind of white men does that make us? Well, one way out of that dilemma, and the Italians are very creative, is to reimagine the other side. And so Italian anthropologists began to propound the view that Ethiopians were, in fact, Caucasians, i.e., white, darkened by exposure to the equatorial sun. In order to recoup in imagination the ignominy of being defeated by black men in reality, we lost to black men? No, we didn't. They weren't black. And here you can see this is uh, Harold Marcus, a, a historian of Ethiopia, talking about the further transmutations the Ethiopians underwent in Italian representations after the defeat at Adawa. They refigured their opponent as a worthy opponent that you could lose to. Of course, this doesn't fully really work. I mean, you can't quite be convinced by this. Bullshit. So uh, Mussolini had to do it all again, right? You can't fully repair wounded Italian pride, precisely because the belief in Western superiority informs European colonial ventures. When these ventures meet with defeat, there's possibility for a kind of cultural blowback. Attawa remained a sore point for the Italians, and restoring Italian greatness as well as expanding its African empire were important popular planks in Benito Mussolini's rise to power. And of course, he, he goes on to try and, and, and repair the stain to Italy's honor when he moves into it, to Ethiopia in 1935-36, one of the precipitating <coughs> events of the, uh, that brings on the Second World War. So you can see here my, at least the, my nascent argument about small wars and world politics in and through these mechanisms of big consequences and identity um, disruption. So we have a falling dynamic, an assumed sense of superiority, a military adventure in the non-Western world, defeat or reverse, political and cultural crisis, 
and then recovery of the sense of Western superiority in altered form to begin the cycle again. There's a connection between war front and home front, even in the absence of modern media. Reports and accounts of what's happening in the war affect politics, society, culture, and identity at home. This is partly why war is such a fundamental experience culturally. You don't need to be bombed on the home front to be profoundly affected, to question the very basis of who we are as a society, as a country. This is why small wars can have such big consequences, even though the barbarians are rarely able to strike the homeland. Let me give you one more example of this interrelationship uh, from the Vietnam War very shortly after American combat forces were deployed in 1965. It concerns a report filed by uh, Morley Safer for CBS in August 1965 uh, concerning a search and destroy mission conducted by the 1-9 Marines near Da Nang. Unlike most news coverage of Vietnam at this time, Safer reported on the systematic burning down of a village. Crucially accompanied by film footage broadcast on national television, the report showed U.S. Marines rousting Vietnamese villagers, young and old, at Bannett Point and setting fire to their homes. When this showed on CBS, CBS's switchboard was deluged with calls. What do you think those calls were about? Viewers were outraged at the report. It could not possibly be true. Right? This is early in Vietnam. The report could not possibly be true because Americans do not do this kind of thing. It's Indians who burn down cabin, log cabins and, and take off the, the women and the old men. President Johnson called the president of CBS to complain. I wish I could do a Texas accent. Uh, I can't remember the CBS's president last name, but this is, this is President Johnson. Frank, are you trying to fuck me? <laughs> Johnson refused to accept that the camera footage was real, believing Safer had bribed a Marine, a Marine officer, to get the, the, the shots he wanted on camera. As Johnson put it, they got to one of our boys. Right? Even Johnson can't believe this is true. Safer, Johnson, Safer was a Canadian. I'm getting there. <laughs> Johnson urged that Safer be investigated. And he had his staff, his staff had the FBI, CIA, and finally the Royal Canadian Mountain, Mounted Police have a look at Safer. Informed that Safer was a Canadian, not a communist, Johnson commented, well, I knew he wasn't an American. Right? And I think that gives you something of the potency of these representations of events that don't fit the Orientalist war story. Later on, of course, you know, a Zippo lighter to burn down Vietnamese village, uh, villages would become a stock feature of the, of the Vietnam War and what Americans were all too prepared to believe was the norm of American soldiers' behavior in, in Vietnam. But that's when it's gone over uh, to the cultural crisis side. OK, so moving on. Let me move on to um, Korea. And then I'll wrap up and take some questions. From the very beginning, Orientalism informed American expectations of what awaited them in Korea. Asian men, according to core Orientalist tropes, are effeminate. With the exception of certain martial races, they are generally incapable of military prowess. When the war broke out, MacArthur and other US officials dramatically underestimated the forces required to fight the North Korean People's Army, the KPA, as I'll refer to it subsequently. MacArthur initially suggested a single US division would be necessary to defend the South and liberate the North. The power and professionalism of the KPA came as a terrific shock to MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo. As the KPA pushed South, uh, pushed South Korean and US forces back to the Pusan perimeter, MacArthur developed a respect for the North Korean soldier, while the New York Times' Arthur Kroc, normally quite level-headed, uh, worried that, quote, the weakest of the satellites is licking hell out of us. So first, you feminize the KPA. One Marine regimental commander thought Korea only useful as a training ground for future fights against a tougher enemy. In the same way, the Germans and the Russians used the Spanish Civil War, he said. And this, of course, is much how British and American officers thought of the Japanese before the Pacific War began. But when the feminized soldiers proved formidable, the frame is disrupted. And the discourse shifts to one of Asiatic hordes that threatened to sweep away the white men through a combination of overwhelming numbers and savagery, a fear seemingly validated when the Chinese later intervened. Even after the Chinese struck and US and UN forces were reeling, 
So there's the summer of 1950. It's, uh, I'll just very quickly not assume everyone knows the basic history of the first year of the Korean War. Um, there are the North Korean forces nearly pushing the US, UN, South Korean into the sea. Oop. There's the invasion of the North in the fall of 1950 after the landings at Incheon that recapture Seoul all the way up to the top. And there's the second time we nearly get pushed into the sea after the Chinese, Chinese intervention. After the Chinese intervention, even as US and UN forces were reeling, a surprising optimism continued to prevail among US high command, and rear area intelligence continued to doubt the evidence. But when reality set in back in Washington, there's a veritable outbreak of Orientalist panic. President Truman called for global mobilization against, quote, the inheritors of Genghis Khan and Tamerlane, the greatest murderers in the history of the world. I think he got that wrong. But <laughs> Herbert Hoover spoke of Asiatic hordes, and others invoked the fall of the Roman Empire to barbarians over <coughs> little old Korea. The military editor of the Times, that's Arthur Kroc, deployed an entire panoply of such analogies, Mongolians, Asiatics, Nazis, locusts, primitives, hordes, thieves. Similar trajectory is evident in the popular coverage of the first year of the war. So this is right at the beginning. US gets into the fight 15 days into the war. But as US forces steadily retreated, and in many cases performed very poorly, the titles of magazines reports began to take on a different tone. Like many armies uh, in, on the advance quickly, the KPA didn't have much time or resource for prisoners. This is an American prisoner of war who's had his hands tied behind his back uh, and then shot dead by the KPA. Not a nice picture. These, by the way, are the 1950s version of the evening news. Um, they are color, weekly color supplements, uh, Saturday evening post, uh, life, uh, and so on. Colliers is the other one I'm taking from. Takes hardly any time at all, and right, we're not the best in the world. He gets hammered. He's a very respected uh, World War II uh, military correspondent. He gets hammered in the letters, but then you get this letter. It's about time in succeeding weeks. It's about time someone put down in print what most of the American people are either afraid to admit are just too picket at the sea, that we're not the best anymore because the North Koreans are beating us. Right, the whole tenor of it. This is all in the first summer. What hurt was to see us retreat. You got the idea. I got a lot more of this, this kind of stuff. Inchon had seemed to promise that the Korean War would fit with the American war story. Now referred to as an imaginary line by Atchison, US and UN forces crossed the 38th parallel in the only attempt at rollback by conventional armed means during the Cold War, uh, other than the invasion of Grenada. The liberation of North Korea and a satisfying total victory seemed to beckon. Far East Command convinced itself that the KPA had been destroyed, divided its forces in three, and sent them hurtling towards the Manchurian border in October and November 1950. There they go. <coughs> the dispositions of US and UN forces during this period defied any normal operation rash operational rationale, at least as would apply in the face of an enemy considered to be effective. The experienced O.P. Smith, commanding the 1st Marine Division, was keenly aware of his vulnerability. And he starts writing letters home uh, to the Marine Corps Commandant, uh, repeatedly protesting uh, about his wide open flanks, the 70 air miles that separated him from supporting forces to the west, and the 170 miles between his northernmost and southernmost battalions, which is a staggering dispersion for a single division in that time. I have little confidence in the tactical judgment of Allman's X Corps or in the realism of their planning, he wrote home. At the same time, Far East Command downplayed steadily growing evidence that large Chinese forces had crossed the Yalu from their staging areas in Manchuria. Moreover, while aware of the high degree of guerrilla activity up and down the Korean peninsula, 
Far East Command fail, failed to realize that a major portion of the KPA had simply taken to the hills behind the U.S. and U.N. front lines. What I'm getting at here is those Orientalist frames of a weak Oriental, uh, Oriental opponent are shaping the operations, the very operations that lead you open to a reprisal when it turns out the Asians aren't quite as stupid as you think. And so I say a little bit more about the details of that. Once the Chinese come in, you can see the poor O.P. Smith and his Marines being evacuated by sea there. Once the Chinese come in, the shock of their intervention set up precisely by that frame of underestimating an Oriental opponent generates the political, economic, cultural, and policy consequences of the Korean War for the U.S. and the Cold War, most of which were set in train in the first tumultuous year of the war, indeed in its first six months. To take just one significant example, the budgetary requirements of NSC 68 moved from the realm of theory to that of practical necessity. The congealing red and yellow perils produced their counterpart in a new militarized anti-communism in Washington, one that perceived the communist bloc in Asiatic terms through a revivified and extremist Orientalism seeking to overcome the humiliation the Chinese and Koreans had inflicted. From a North American perspective, it's one thing to exterminate Indians on the home continent and regulate the numbers of Asians subsequently allowed in. It is quite another to confront the Oriental multitude on the borderlands of its home continent. This was the situation of US and UN forces just south of the Yalu in late 1950. There were not enough white soldiers to overcome the Asian mass in its own homeland. When the Chinese put their marker down in North Korea, Americans had to give up the idea of a continually expanding frontier and turn their attention to trying to close it, to wall it off with their ace in the hole technology. This is MacArthur's G2, his, his general again. Fortunately, the Western genius for complex machinery has come to the rescue. Instruments of mass destruction in being or under design could stem the flood of communist cannon fodder. Thus, the successful Chinese campaign to evict the US and the UN from North Korea in late 1950 and early 1951 constitutes a crucial turning point in the American experience of Orientalist war. This is the moment at which total victory ceased to be possible. And the tensions between assertions of Western superiority and a context of Oriental prowess strongly in evidence. Right? The tensions were strongly in evidence between assertions of Western superiority and Oriental prow prowess. My ar ar archival research is uh, in its initial stages, and I'm not going to go through that. But let me just give you a flavor of some of the kinds of comments that are made to give you a sense of why it then becomes such a shock. Uh, this is the core commander that uh, O.P. Smith was complaining about. Any American soldier is the equivalent of 20 Chinamen in combat. He wrote in a letter at the time of having extracted the Marines and soldiers from this cesspool of humanity centered around the Chosin Reservoir. Cesspool is one instance of the many liquid and hydraulic metaphors employed to describe the Chinese and North Korean forces. Although those forces were regularly organized in corps, divisions, and subunits occupying distinct stretches of territory and were clearly marked as such on the maps that Almond was using at the time, these metaphors transformed the Chinese armies into an all-encompassing, amorphous, and in this case, stinking mass, a quicksand from which Americans had to be pulled out. Back at Far East Command in Tokyo, after noting that in a short period the U.S. and U.N. forces had inflicted some 80,000 casualties on the Chinese, the Daily Intelligence Summary for 14 December 1950 commented that given the almost bottomless well of manpower potential, the overall effect of the losses on the Chinese forces is almost negligible. Here again, the Chinese are conceived in liquid terms, but now also inexhaustible, as if arising from some limitless underground reservoir. Right? You can see here how Orientalist tropes are informing the you know, military intelligence documents by which you're understanding your enemy. Chinese forces of, south of the Yalu at that time were less than half million. It almost goes without saying that American officers imagined Asian lives as infinitely expendable by their leaders. In fact, the heavy casualties of American firepower inflicted on Chinese forces in the Korean War made a lasting impression on Mao's generals. Far East Command's G2, this Willoughby character, whipsawed between fears of the Oriental multitude and Ullman-style confidence in the fighting powers of the Western soldier. 
In a press conference on 1 December with the Chinese offensive in motion, Willoughby was asked if the Chinese had sufficient forces to push the US and UN out of Korea. Come, 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 he said. You don't push Britishers and Americans around like that. But evidently, you could. I love the Britishers. He's a, a Prussian uh, emigre to the, um, the US um, and ends up serving in, with Mark MacArthur throughout World War II. I've got more material, but I kind of think I've got my point across. Um, I hope I have anyways. <coughs> but uh, just to see off the frontier theme. Oh, I don't have it. Never mind. You won't see off the frontier theme. Um, what MacArthur came up with, right, you have to, you know, this is really significant for US Americans, right? We start on the East Coast of the United States, we go all the way to California, carry on to Hawaii, carry on to the Philippines, we defeat the Japanese, and then we get stymied in Korea. And uh, MacArthur, you know, very concerned that Pacific is a moat, we have to be based in Asia and so on, but he knows that he's not going to be able to go any farther than the Yalu River. So his big idea is to irradiate the Yalu River. He wants to take, a, he found a particular kind of um, a radiation that you could, you could you know, deliver by trucks all along the border, right? And the idea was that he would radiate the Yalu, then the Chinese couldn't come through. He would insert the nationalist Chinese armies just below the Yalu, and somehow the nationalist Chinese, instead of going into China, as of course they wanted to do, would head south and trap the Chinese armies between the UN forces and Korea. So there's MacArthur's plan for victory, right? He also wanted to nuke Manchuria as well to make this possible. Um, there's his plan for victory, but note that even MacArthur was going to seal off the frontier. And I think, you know, that's a pretty significant moment. After that, it's limited war. And that satisfying total victory is denied the American war story <coughs> ever after except maybe in Grenada. OK. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much.